Hi, welcome back. Let's talk about palliative care too, palliation of symptoms. Before we launch into symptoms though, let's go back to the most important take home message that I really wanna drive home. And that is this, what palliative care is and what it's not. Palliative care to remind us all is not end of life care, but it is care focused on improving quality of life for people with serious illness. That's what I want you to keep in your minds as we talk about palliation of symptoms. Why talk about this? Well, because that's what patients tell us is important to them. In surveys of patients with serious illness and their family members, consistently what comes to the top of the list is that people want palliation of symptoms, which is to say they tell us, I don't wanna be in pain, I don't wanna be short of breath, I'm scared that I'll be in pain. I don't wanna be fatigued and nauseated. And unfortunately, symptoms are very common for people who have serious illness. And relieving symptoms is the most important thing we do to ensure patients that we know how to take care of them and we can help them feel better and give them a better quality of life. I should also say here by way of introduction that when you look at palliative care as a field and when I think about learning and teaching palliative care, while there is a lot to know in this area, in many ways it is also the easiest part of what we do, which is to say that so many symptoms can be relieved by relatively simple interventions uh, with medications and with other measures to help make people feel physically comfortable. So while it's challenging, it's also something that can be done and can be done well to help our patients feel better. So what do we know about symptoms? Well, we know that they're very prevalent and it's not just for people with cancer. So if you look here, here's some data that compares people with cancer, COPD and heart failure across a number of symptoms from a variety of studies. And what we can see is not surprisingly when we look at pain, for example, not surprisingly, 96% of people in some studies of people with cancer have pain, but look at people with COPD and heart failure. Pain is incredibly common there as well in diseases that we wouldn't consider to be painful. Now, why is that? In fact, COPD and heart failure are not very painful. Sure, some people with heart failure will have chest pain, will have angina, for example. Um, some people with heart failure will have edema that's really massive and very uncomfortable. But what we know from studies that we've done here at UCSL, UCSF and elsewhere is that people with heart failure, COPD, they're also older and they have pain, not just from their underlying disease, like their chest pain from heart failure, but also they have back pain, they have arthritis, they have diabetic neuropathy. The kinds of pain syndromes that are very common in people, also common in people with these conditions. Fatigue is also incredibly common. And you can see here over 80% of people with serious illness will have fatigue. Fatigue can be very difficult to manage, very difficult to treat, but very distressing to patients. Fortunately, there are treatments for fatigue that can help people feel better. Treatments such as, for example, maximizing their heart failure treatments. So people who are really well managed as well as possible with their heart failure feel better. Simple things like caffeine, believe it or not, um, can increase exercise tolerance in people with heart failure. That doesn't mean I necessarily tell everybody to go out and get a double espresso, but if they like drinking coffee, I certainly do encourage it. What about dyspnea? Dyspnea is also very common. Not surprisingly for people with COPD, dyspnea is incredibly common. Up to 95% of people with COPD will have dyspnea, a very distressing symptom. And while we talk a lot about pain, uh, being very important. Um, the thing about dyspnea is that for many patients, when they're short of breath, they think they're gonna die. And if you've ever seen someone who's short of breath, you can see the incredible distress. And when a patient is home and becomes short of breath in the middle of the night and doesn't have a way to make that better, they're gonna call an ambulance. Nobody thinks they're gonna die from pain. Oh sure, they might say, you know, this pain is killing me or the pain is so bad I wish I could die. But they don't think they're gonna die. People who are short of breath worry that they're going to suffocate. Having a plan for people with shortness of breath, a plan that they can use at home is critical to allow them to stay home if they want and to relieve their symptoms quickly. What can be done? Oxygen for people who are hypoxic. But many randomized trials have shown us that oxygen is not helpful for people who are not hypoxic. 
air works just as well. In fact, if you think about it and you talk to patients with heart failure and you ask them what they do in the middle of the night when they get short of breath, maybe you've done this, what do they tell you? Right? They say, oh, I go to the window and I open the window and I breathe fresh air. Well, we all know that the percentage of oxygen in the fresh air outside is the same as inside, it's 21%. So it's not that they're getting more oxygen, but they are in fact feeling better because cool, fresh air blowing across the face in fact makes people feel better. We have fans in our comfort care suites at UCSF, and I offer that to patients. Fans going outside, getting fresh air can make them feel better. And then finally, opioids are the single best drug demonstrated in multiple randomized trials for being effective in dyspnea. And so for patients who are short of breath, despite other treatments, despite maximal treatment for their heart failure or their COPD, if they're hypoxic and they're on oxygen, they're still short of breath, low doses of opioids, much lower than we need for pain uh, typically, may do wonders for people. They don't stop breathing, but they feel much better. Doses, for example, of one to two milligrams of oral morphine can sometimes provide a lot of relief. Depression. Unfortunately, depression is exceedingly common as well. We see this a lot in the palliative care setting among people with serious illness. The point I want to make to you about depression is that it is treatable and it is not normal. So you may hear somebody say, well, who wouldn't be depressed if they had pancreatic cancer that was metastatic? Who wouldn't be depressed if they had heart failure and they were bed bound? The answer is depression is not normal. It is pathologic even in serious illness and even very close to the end of life, which is to say that it is amenable to treatment and treating depression is important to help people have a better quality of life. The challenge, of course, is when people are sick and they're fatigued and they're having pain and they don't get out of bed and they don't have an appetite, it can be hard to diagnose depression. And so rather than using the physical symptoms, like how are you sleeping, how are you eating, how's your appetite, we like to ask more of the psychological symptom. Well, one, are you depressed? Is a very good screening question. Followed up with, typically, do you still do things you enjoy? Well, I've got metastatic cancer. I have class four heart failure. No, I don't do the things I enjoy. So what do we ask? When you look to the future, what do you hope for? Hopelessness is a sign of depression. And even people who are very sick, and very restricted in their activities, will be able to tell you what they hope for. When I hear a patient say to me, you know, Dr. Panlet, I don't hope for anything. I have no hope. That makes me think they might be depressed. The other thing I ask is, do you feel helpless? Helplessness is another sign of depression. And depression responds to treatment. For people who are very sick, who may not have the six weeks necessary for an SSRI, to take effect, for example, we will use methylphenidate at low doses to help people feel better and to relieve their depression. There's very nice data for that in the setting of cancer. And insomnia. Insomnia is also very, very common. Um, patients have difficulty sleeping for a variety of reasons. Very often that reason is that they are in pain and their pain medicine doesn't last and so they wake up in the middle of the night for that. That's why long-acting pain medications are so important for our patients, particularly if they have pain at night. And if you get that history, I woke up in pain and I had to take more pain medicine, really think about that long-acting pain medicine very close to bedtime, right at bedtime, that might allow someone to sleep through the night. I shared with you a little bit about treatment of these symptoms. And what I want to tell you is that there are good guidelines and good information about treating symptoms. There's much more here than we can cover in this one module, but there are lots of resources for you, both in the palliative care world and the palliative care literature, as well as in other settings that can help you manage these symptoms. Relief of symptoms is really job number one, because if we don't relieve symptoms, patients are focused on them, and they can't really attend to what's important when they have serious illness, right? Nobody wants to focus on their pain or their shortness of breath or their fatigue. That just gets in the way of what's important. The challenge, of course, is that those symptoms really grab your attention. I mean, anyone who's had severe pain or who's had nausea knows that you just can't focus on anything else. Relieving those symptoms allows people to attend to the things that really are important, to what they want to accomplish, to what they want to still get done, to be with their family and friends and enjoy their company. Relief of symptoms is job one. 
To do that, we have to ask about the common symptoms. Amazingly, patients won't always tell us, so we have to ask. A screen of all the common symptoms, pain, dyspnea, fatigue, depression, anxiety, nausea. And finally, to treat aggressively. We often think that, oh, palliative care is not aggressive treatment, but it is aggressive treatment. It aggressively manages symptoms that are distressing to patients. Our goal on the palliative care team, if we have someone who's in severe pain, is to have them out of pain by the end of the day, but certainly by the next day. And if you have a patient who's really in severe pain that you've admitted to the hospital or you're seeing them in the clinic, your goal is to get them out of pain in a matter of hours, not days. The same thing is true with other symptoms. Treat them aggressively. Treat them responsibly. Treat them responsibly. Treat them cautiously but also treat them aggressively. And I know that sounds like we're doing two things at the same time, but what it says is that we need to reassess, be at the bedside, provide the medications that are helpful, see how they work, assure the patient that we're gonna get them, get their symptoms under control and do that quickly. Here is a comfort care suite at UCSF Medical Center. We have two of these. They're currently up on the 14th floor at the end of the hall, looking out with this beautiful view of San Francisco. Why do I show you this? Because these suites are an attempt to create an environment that promotes comfort for patients. That's why we call them the comfort care suites. And it's in part to remind us all that the environment of care can be very healing to patients as well and can help relieve their symptoms. We often don't recognize how much the interventions we are doing are actually adding to patients' discomfort, their physical discomfort. Even things as simple as oxygen can irritate the nose and irritate the top of the ears, and taking off the oxygen often makes people feel better. The sequential compression devices that many of our patients wear when we're worried about preventing DVT just make people more uncomfortable. Blood draws, even a blood pressure cuff, can, make, can limit their mobility and can cause discomfort. When I look at a patient and I think to myself, how can I make this person as comfortable as possible? I look at them and I think, what are all the things we are doing to them and what might we take away that would make them more comfortable? What kind of peaceful environment might I be able to provide to help them feel better, to have less pain, to have less discomfort? Turn on a fan to ease their shortness of breath rather than giving them more oxygen if they're not hypoxic. When I walk, sometimes I'll walk into the comfort care suite um, and it's, you can see it's a beautiful setting. We have floors uh, that look like hardwood. They're linoleum, but they look like hardwood. The big flat screen TV, the beautiful view, all the couches and chairs that you see in this picture will fold out so families can spend the night. I've walked in in the morning, eight people have spent the night. There's a porta crib set up so that the grandchild can be there. One time there was a kid playing Xbox on the, on the screen, uh, all set up to look like home. It's not home. Really, it's not home. If you went to sleep one night and we transported you into this room while you were sleeping and you woke up, you would not think you were home. But it's a very nice setting. I should also tell you that while you don't see it, all the medical equipment is there, air, oxygen, suction, but it's hidden behind a panel. If we don't need to medicalize it, we don't. But if we have to, for the comfort of the patient, we can. An environment set up to reflect the plan of care and to really focus on comfort. Sometimes I'll, I'll walk in and the family has created a shrine to the patient on the, on the shelf by the window. Photographs, mementos uh, of the patient's life. Uh, and it's really quite beautiful. I, in fact, one time I walked in and uh, the sun was setting so you could see the glow of the sunset outside the window. And it was really very beautiful. There were about 20 people in the room and they had lit candles all over the room. So there was this beautiful glow inside the room. And I was standing there talking with the family and the patient was really unresponsive by that point, very peaceful looking. And the nurse walked over to me and whispered, Dr. Panelat, you can't have fire in a hospital. And I thought, of course, of course you can't have fire. And she said, tell them to blow out the candles, uh, which I did. I said, you know, I'm really sorry, but this is beautiful, but this is a fire hazard and we, we can't have open flames in the hospital. And so they did, which was terrific. Um, still very beautiful. 
Uh, and then a few minutes later, as I was walking out of the room, I just thought to myself, how did that become my responsibility as the doctor uh, for telling them to do that? Um, but I, I, I did what I was, uh, what I was asked to do. Um, my point in, in talking to you about the Comfort Care Suite is that environment can really support the plan of care. Even if your patient is in an ICU, is in a step-down unit, is in the emergency room, is at home, we want to think about how can we create an environment that really supports the plan of care and makes it as comfortable as possible for the patient. So in thinking about symptoms, it can sometimes seem overwhelming that there are too many symptoms, patients are, are having this physical suffering, what can we do about it? And yet, what I wanna reassure you is that we can treat them, and I wanna quote Helen Keller, who wrote in her book, Optimism, that although the world is full of suffering, it is also full of the overcoming of it. And while we may have patients who have a lot of suffering, I want to ensure you that you, working with the patient, can overcome it. So to review, people with serious illness have many distressing symptoms that need treatment. And if you ask your patients about them, you will find that they have a lot of symptoms. Relief of symptoms is job one. It really allows the patient then to really think about the bigger issues, the broader issues that really matter to them, the things we'll be talking about in the next two modules. Many resources exist to guide symptom management. I gave you just a touch of how you might approach symptoms in this module, but I want you to know that there are a lot of resources out there that you can use to provide good symptom management for your patient so that they are confident that you know how to take care of them and so that you can then help them focus on what's really important. Thank you very much.